Um, it varies, but that, right here in the that? smallest, its diameter is two. Or, uh, um, two. two. No. Yeah, two. And the radius two. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. If instead of this, if I looked at x squared plus y squared equals z squared plus 4, then I would be looking here at circles and the radius greater than or equal to 4, depending on the value of z. So you give me different values of z, I give you bigger and bigger circles. And I get this kind of shape. Extending along the z-axis. Um, it's either an elliptical hyperbola or a hy hyperbolic elliptic. I don't know. <laughs> but if you take your cuts in other directions, so if you look at this guy, you cut it horizontally parallel to the xy plane, you get circles. If you slice it parallel to the other planes, that's your hyperbola. That's what you would get, for instance, if you let y equal 1. y equals 1, that gives you x squared minus z squared equals 3. That's a hyperbola. That's this stuff. All right? Now, personally, I find it much easier stacking circles and ellipses than I ever do stacking hyperbolas or parabolas. So I always look for the circles <coughs> or the ellipses because if this is x squared plus y squared equals z squared plus 4, it's also for me this. The differences between these two have to do with how far out these circles extend. <coughs> or ellipses, I guess these would be. But same fundamental shape. It's going to be wrapped around the z-axis. If you let z equal 0, you have 3x squared plus 2y squared equals 4. It's an ellipse. If z is plus or minus 1, 3x squared plus 2y squared equals 5. Bigger ellipse. Okay? Questions here? Okay. Um, Variations. These things just. Yeah. Let's look at x squared plus y squared equals um, z squared minus 4. This is going to make a pretty significant difference. Instead of going z squared plus 4, I went z squared minus 4. And again, if I put coefficients in front of the x squared, y squared, or z squared, it, minimal difference. Do they get smaller now? Hmm? No, no, it's... And, and this is part of what I want you guys to be able to 
you know, get used to thinking. Because this is, I think, a different way of attacking the problem. I want you to look for the squares because what I know is that left-hand side is always greater than or equal to zero. That was a non-issue here. Mm -hmm. Because x squared plus y squared is always greater than or equal to zero, but in fact, on the right-hand side, it's four or greater. That's not the case here. If z is zero, I'd have x squared plus y squared is negative four. Mm -mm. x squared plus y squared cannot be negative four. Because on the left-hand side this is positive, it's going to force z squared minus 4 to be positive, and that means z is either 2 or larger or negative 2 and smaller. So I'm looking for the guys that are positive throw everything else over to the other side. This right here is going to tell me that my graph has got to lie above z or equal to z equals 2 and below z equals negative 2. If you let z equal plus or minus 2, you would have x squared plus y squared equals 0, which would mean x and y are both 0. Those are those two points. Z is plus or minus 2. That's x and y must be 0. Z can't be less than 2 or bigger than, well, can't in absolute values be less than 2 because you can't have a square <coughs> is equal a negative. If I let z get a little bit bigger, say plus or minus 3, <coughs> I have x squared plus y squared equals 5. Okay, so 9 minus 4, that's a circle. And if I let z equal plus or minus 4, I get z or x squared plus y squared equals 12. Another circle, just a bigger one. think about this stuff. And if I had done 2x squared plus 3y squared equals 5z squared minus 4, it's the same shape, although I'd have to figure out where my restrictions are as for z. I have to make sure 5z squared minus 4 is greater than or equal to 0. But it's that same basic shape, except for that these cross-sectional cuts will be ellipses. And if I had x squared plus z squared equals y squared minus 4, the orientation changes. This, instead of spreading along z, this would be spread along 
y. So you see how to generate out different acts, uh, different <coughs> orientations, algebraically, not algebraically. Okay. X squared plus y squared equals z squared. This is my circle stuff. Everything here is positive. I don't have any restrictions. If you start with z equals 0, you get x squared plus y squared is 0. So x and y are both 0. This means that my graph goes through the origin. If you let z equal plus or minus 1, you get x squared plus y squared is 1. That's a circle. z is plus or minus 2. You get a bigger circle. But you don't get this shape. What you actually get is a cone. Well, it's supposed to be symmetric about the y-axis, or around the z-axis here. How do I know I don't have a rounded kind of bullet shape? Take a look at the other cross-sectional slices. If you let up here y say, equals zero, then your x squared plus y squared equals z squared becomes x squared equals z squared, or x is plus or minus z lines. <coughs> so you get that. Now, you know, basically, there's, I, I always mean to look up software and I always forget to do it, but you've got this progression between this kind of shape So this was something like x squared plus y squared equals um, z squared plus 4. And if you look at x squared plus y squared equals z squared plus 1, what you would see is this would get skinnier in the middle here. Eventually it gets very wide but this starts collapsing in until x squared plus y squared equals z squared. So the smaller this constant is, the skinnier you get right in the middle there until you reach this point out, <coughs> you know, it's a cone and it's as skinny as it can get. And then you transition Instead of adding positive constants, you look at adding negative constants. In which case, your cone starts pulling away and it splits into two. You can usually get a nice video of that on a graphing, you know, graphing site. You can see the progression of these constants. Okay. Um,
I no longer have three squares. I'm linear in one of my variables. I'm still going to keep my squares together. This is greater than or equal to zero. So therefore, I need z plus 4 to be greater than or equal to 0, which means z must be greater than or equal to negative 4. Past that, if you let z equal negative 4, you get x squared plus y squared is 0, so x and y are 0. And as you let z increase, you just get circles. And the circles get bigger as z increases. So z is negative 3. You'd have x squared plus y squared equals 1. And so you get a circle in here. And as you increase z, you just get bigger and bigger circles. And so you get a bullet-shaped thing, but it's just on one side. And if the square was on the x and the z, if you had x squared plus z squared, equals y plus 4. This would say y is bigger than or equal to negative 4, and you'd flip it on its side. We're going to see these different orientations. Okay. How, do, how do we know if it's going to be one of these parabola style 3D shapes or cone? If it's going to have a straight it's those cross sections. It's, where did I do it? I guess I did it right here. It's when, when you look at this, if you let y <coughs> say equals 0, you get x squared equals z squared. The same thing as saying x uh, okay. is plus or minus z. So, so they're completely equal to each other. Okay. Yeah. The coefficients like, and the exponents yeah. are yeah. all equal. And, yeah, I mean, had I done this, it, it would be not a um, symmetrical. symmetrical cone. And, and it, the stuff gets real fluky. I mean, if I do this, it looks very similar to this. All I've done is remove the square. Z here is only allowed to be bigger than or equal to zero. But if I let Y say equals zero, I get X squared equals Z, which is a parabola. Mm. And so what you get here is not that nice cone, but you get this shape. Okay? Now, I, I have to really stress, oh, I, there's one other shape which I cannot draw. And the shape generates from this where when you put your squares on the same side they're opposite sign and the other variables linear that gives you a saddle okay so okay. these shapes are sitting in the book the book gives them all really nice names what page is that hmm? what page is that uh, the 710. It's sitting in section 12, 6, yeah. 
So, you know, you get elliptic cylinders and hyperbolic cylinders that don't even look like cylinders. Um, down here, ellipsoid, <coughs> hyperboloid one sheet. This is a hyperboloid of two sheets. I mean, it, they're words. You know, I don't ever remember the words because I can't remember anything. The one thing I want to point out is this guy down below, that's your saddle shape thing. I can't draw those. Paraboloid? Um, it's, yeah, it's para yeah, it's a paraboloid, I guess. But, I mean, basically the way a saddle shape works is if you're right in that middle, depending on what direction you go, you either are going down or you're going up. And your cross sections are all parabolas. Either parabolas going up or parabolas going down. All right? I am not going to ask you guys to draw these, but we will be using these shapes in other problems as we proceed. On an exam, it will be matching. And the matching that I'm going to be concerned with is making sure that you see restrictions, making sure you see orientations around which axis. Okay? So, you know, I, it's general stuff that I'm really looking for here, not your ability to draw, but your ability to look at a picture and look at a formula and see how they relate. I just, I was just thinking, I've never really thought of a saddle as a geometric shape. That was pretty cool. Like, oh, they are. You know? Yeah. But, it's I mean, a saddle is, it's like this. Yeah. Y equals X cubed. You've got an inflection point there. And yet it's neither a max nor a min. You move up in one direction, you're going down in another. You know, it's neither a max nor a min, and so this is doing it, you know, it's like going like this, and then like that. Okay, questions here. Okay. Okay, this is section 12.6, all of this stuff here. Um, section 12.7 looks at two different coordinate systems other than the Cartesian coordinate system. I generally would prefer doing that when we need it. Because if I run through all these definitions now, by the time we need it, which will be with the integration, you'll have forgotten it. <laughs> and it's disjointed from everything at this point. So we'll cycle back and instead, starting to chapter 13, which will begin the calculus to a certain extent again. Okay? So, starting in 13, we have vector valued functions. A new kind of function. So, you're going to get a whole bunch of new ways of representing and thinking about functions in this class. Vector valued functions are going to have their domain. Have to be real numbers. But the range will be vectors. Vectors may be in two space, they may be in three space. For that matter, they could be any dimension. Example. 
these are typically written like this. Or like this. You know, you either write them as a vector using the brackety vector notation, or if you prefer, you can use the i, j, or i, j, and k notation. So, up above here, if I said, what is r of 2, you would tell me that was the vector 2, 7. <coughs> The range consists of vectors. That means when I write this function, I have to put a vector symbol over the top. Or if, it, if you're reading it in the book, it will be in bold. Okay? If I look at this example, I'm looking, in essence, at a parametrized curve. This would tell me that x of t is t, and y of t is t squared plus 3. Now, many times it's very difficult, if not impossible, to come up with the relationships between your variables, but this one's pretty easy. Notice that this also would tell me that y is equal to x squared plus 3. And so this parametrizes the following curve. y is x squared plus 3. So this is the path. that I'm moving along. But I haven't given you orientation, although we talked about parametrized curves. We move up to the right there, and suddenly okay. No, they did. Okay. For a second there, I thought I forgot something in the last section. I didn't. Okay? Now, this is a function. One of the first things you guys do in pre-calculus is understand the relationship between a picture and the function that generated it. You know, so you have these old exercises you know, if this is y equals f of x, and I say, what is f of 3? You know, you come over here to 3, and you come up, and f of 3 would be sitting over there, and this point would have coordinates 3, f of 3, etc. So, what I want is a way of visualizing this function. So, if I write r of t equals t e squared plus 3, that gives me a parametrization along this path, y is x squared plus 3, and as I've indicated, R of, say, 1 would be the vector 1, 4. The way in which I visualize this 
is I am going to draw this vector with its tail at the origin. So this would be the vector r of 1. If I look at the vector r of 2, that would be the vector 2, 7. I draw this vector with its tail at the origin. This would be r of 2. This would be the point to seven. And if I compute R of three, I would draw that vector with its tail at the origin. When I do this, the tip of these vectors trace out a path. And that path corresponds to a visualization of the function. So basically, I continue this. The head of these vectors traces a path. which is how I will visualize my vector valued function. Okay, now, this is a generic function y equals f of x. And you guys all understand what I mean by that. Here's a generic picture of r. I'll do it in two dimensions. curve in space. Notice the orientation. If I told you R of 3 corresponded to this vector and I gave you a couple of choices here. So call this vector 1 call that vector 2, and I said, which is R of 1, vector 1 or 2. Look at the direction of motion. Two. And so, prior time, this is R of 3.